Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Trevor Morrison. I'm the dean at the law school here at NYU. And it is my pleasure on behalf of NYU to welcome you all here today for our Constitution Day celebration. Uh, as I hope you all know, Constitution Day marks the day in 1787, September 17th to be exact, uh, when the delegates to the Constitutional Convention all signed the document in Philadelphia. Uh, and it was Senator Robert Byrd who uh, imposed a, the legal requirement that all educational institutions receiving federal funds recognize Constitution Day, but it's not because he said we had to, but because we want to, that we are all here today, um, to uh, take in the wonderful conversation featuring Justice Sonia Sotomayor. We are thrilled that Justice Sotomayor is joining us here again at NYU, um, and she will be introduced directly in a moment. I do want to thank the organizers who helped to put on this wonderful event, uh, Consource, iCivics, and the Institute for Constitutional History, uh, and the New York Historical Society. Constitution Day does give us a chance to reflect on our founding document, a document that still today gives power to our institutions while restraining our worst impulses. The importance of our Constitution cannot be overstated, but celebrating its creation is a noble and important thing to do in the education of future generations, and so thank you all for being here today as part of that effort. I now want to turn uh, the microphone over to Julie Silverbrook, Executive Director of the Constitutional Sources Project. Thank you again, and please join me in welcoming Julie. Good afternoon. As Dean Morrison shared with you, I am Julie Silverbrook, Executive Director of the Constitutional Sources Project, or CONSORS for short. We are so glad you all joined us today to celebrate the 231st anniversary of the signing of the U.S. Constitution on September 17, 1787. I always like to kick off Constitution Day events the same way, uh, with a story. Uh, about Benjamin Franklin at the end of the Constitutional Convention. He's approached by a woman who asks him what sort of government the delegates had created. He famously replied, a republic, if you can keep it. To keep it, citizens actually have to know about it. And unfortunately, the American people know shockingly little about even the most basic elements of our government and the Constitution that found it. I won't depress you too much, so I'm only gonna share a couple of the stats. More than one in three people, 37%, could not name a single right protected by the First Amendment. Only one in four, 26%, can name all three branches of government. One in three, a higher proportion, of the population can't name any branch of government. None, not even one, there are only three. <laughs> the grand American experiment in self-government only works if our citizens are informed and engaged. This is why the hosts of this afternoon's program, Consource, iCivics, and the Institute for Constitutional History, work tirelessly 365 days a year to educate citizens of all ages about the US Constitution and our system of government. Our collective mission is to get our nation's citizens excited to learn more about the Constitution and to become civically engaged. I want to spotlight a couple of the exciting programs that Consource has uh, that allow uh, people of all ages to become connected to the Constitution. First and foremost, we have a free digital library of historical documents tracing the creation, ratification, and amendment of the US Constitution. Uh, this includes the Federalist Papers, uh, the uh, soon to be the, the full documentary history of the ratification of the Constitution, of course the Constitutional Convention records, and much, much more. Uh, we also create lesson plans uh, that are primary source rich, interactive, and student-centered. Uh, and importantly, because this is a partnership with NYU, uh, we are a partner in the constitutional history in the classroom, a collaborative teacher pro professional development program uh, that's hosted in partnership with the Institute for Constitutional History and NYU's Steinhardt School of Education Social Studies program. I wanna give a shout out to two amazing people in the front row here, Dr. Mava Marcus and Dr. Robbie Cohn, who I'm sure are thrilled that I'm introducing them. <laughs> These two individuals are the moving force behind the constitutional history in the classroom program, and I am thrilled uh, to see so many alum in, in the audience today. 
Uh, I invite all of you uh, to learn more about our programs by visiting consource.org. In a moment, I will ask my colleague, Louise Dubé, Executive Director of iCivics, to join me on stage to introduce the person you're all here to see, Justice Sotomayor, and Carmen Gonzalez. Before I do that, I'd like to thank a few people for making today's event possible. I'd like to begin by thanking Dean Morrison, NYU Law School, and the staff at Skirbel Auditorium. I'd also like to thank the incredible teams at iCivics, Consource, and the Institute for Constitutional History for the countless hours that went into planning today's Constitution Day event. And last, but certainly not least, I'd like to sincerely thank Justice Sotomayor for joining us today and for all the work she does to promote civic learning in this country. We are incredibly fortunate to have her as part of the dynamic, vibrant, and growing civic education community. This country is on the precipice of a much needed civics education revival. Everyone attending today's event, whether they know it or not, uh, is a part uh, of this movement and can help us address the civic literacy and engagement crisis in this country. We are grateful to all of you for being here today to celebrate Constitution Day, and with that, I'd like to invite Louise Dubé, a moving force, a major force, really, behind the civics education revival to the stage. Thank you, and happy Constitution Day. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is going to be a very exciting day. I am Louise Dubé, and I am the executive director of iCivics. A warm welcome to all of you. A shout out to all of the 200 and more students who have joined us today. Um, and I think they're pretty excited about our special guests. So thank you for coming. Before I continue, uh, just a few notes of housekeeping. We would ask you to switch off your cell phones and your electronic devices. Put them away, please. We ask you that because we ask you to refrain from taking photos or videos. Be assured that we are videotaping, recording this event, and the recording will be available to watch both on the Consource website and on the iCivics websites very shortly after the event. When you came in, our volunteers gave you, I think, handed out some cards and pens. If you have those cards and pens are to be used, to jot down some questions to be asked. If you still have a question to be asked, please find one of our volunteers. They're gonna do one last turn uh, and collect them. We know we will get a lot of questions, so we apologize if we can't get to yours, um, but just know it's because of volume and for no other reason. So, without further ado, it is my great honor to introduce our special guest today. I have worked with Justice Sotomayor over the last three years. Justice Sotomayor serves on the iCivics board as a board member, and I have gotten to know her quite a bit. Um, and she is just uh, the most important uh, individual and that has changed kids' life in my experience. iCivics is, if you don't know it, the largest civic education provider in our nation. We developed digital educational games and other resources to teach to make the rule of law and the, our system of government relevant to five million kids a year. We work in all classrooms all over the 50 states in the United States. In my uh, years with Justice Sotomayor, I've learned that she doesn't like long introductions. So I am going to skip the standard uh, legal scholar. Everybody knows uh, that she is a stellar scholar. And I don't think we need to uh, detail out all of her pedigree, but be assured it is there. Many of you undoubtedly have read her incredibly moving memoir, My Beloved World. And so you know a little bit about her personal story. What you might not know is what she does in her quote unquote spare time. In the last three years that I've known her, she has visited over 100 schools. Together we've been to middle schools, elementary schools, high schools, and colleges all over the country. In 
each of these schools, just as Sotomayor found a bridge between her life story and the students' life story. She empathized with their struggle, but yet she urged them to strive to do well. The immediate connection that she makes with kids is just short of awe-inspiring. I've seen tears in those audiences. I've also seen silence in seventh grade, which is some pretty amazing stuff. <laughs> On this Constitution Day and in this great university, Justice Sotomayor reminds us that it is through personal connection that we learn. She is our country's greatest ambassador of the law to its youngest citizen. Justice Sotomayor will be in interviewed by Carmen Iguina Gonzalez. Carmen is a distinguished alumna from the NYU Law School. She was most recently a clerk to Justice Sotomayor. Prior to that, she served as a staff attorney with the ACLU of Southern California, where she litigated landmark immigration and constitutional uh, and criminal justice cases. With that, I give you Carmen Iguina Gonzalez and the Honorable Sonia Sotomayor, Associate Justice of the U Supreme Court of the United States, author and tireless champion of civic education. Thank you. I'm thinking we should sing happy birthday to the Constitution. Oh. <laughs> I think that would be a fitting start to the, uh, to the evening. But we can at least think it. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, what a privilege, uh, really, for all of us to be spending Constitution Day with you, one of you know, the women and men whose job descriptions is so tied um, to that very important document. And, um, I think, you know, the first time I learned about Constitution Day was as a lawyer, and I think there's um, this perception that it's, the Constitution is something that you study if you're a lawyer, or you're a judge, or somehow your job has to do with that document. And so I, I wonder what's your answer to, to that sort of perception of what the Constitution means um, in our daily lives? It's interesting, because I give credit to one of my, um, I don't want to call him former, but one of the colleagues I served with, Nino Scalia. Um, many years ago, I was introducing him at an event at another university, which will remain anonymous from in this setting. <laughs> and his speech was about citizen lawyers. And the whole thesis of the speech was reminding people that the Constitution was created both by lawyers and non-lawyers. There were 39 signers of the Constitution. 20 of two of them only had, were lawyers or had law backgrounds, but they were doing something else. And the rest, the remainder, was just ordinary citizens. Now, let's remember it excluded people of color, it excluded women, but it had a representation from the entire society. And Ben Franklin was right. They created a republic, but they left it up to us to keep it. And so for me, it is not an instrument just of lawyers or judges. It is an instrument that defines us as a community. It created the United States of America. And with that creation, the government and its people, both are recognized in this instrument. Look at Article 10, um, which the court has done very little to give meaning to, by the way. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. So it is something that was written for
for everyone. Our new system of government, but and for the state and for its people. So for me, no, I seriously believe, and as Lee's told you, I am working my hardest to ensure that everyone understands that this is our constitution. And what would you say to the, the non-lawyers in the room um, who want to learn more? Uh, where should they start? What would you consider is the, the really core required reading if you want to understand? Read it. <laughs> <laughs> it isn't that big. You know, but it is sad because just like you, I never read it before I got to law school. Not cover to cover. It takes you all of 15 minutes. I'm a fast reader, so it may take <laughs> some people a little longer. But most people have never even read it. Um, and to me, that's somewhat shameful that it is not something that's not given to middle schoolers because its text is certainly simple enough for a middle schooler to read. Um, and most Americans, and I sometimes wonder if all lawyers would answer that they have read it. I know most Americans have not. Um, and that is somewhat sad. So where would I go? I would go to the Constitution itself. It's free on the internet. There's no, uh, there's no copyright on it any longer, if there ever was one. But um, most importantly, there are so many avenues of resources now. Uh, Julie just spoke about a bunch of them. iCivics itself has a bunch of resources. Certainly the Institute for Constitutional History does. There are so many avenues of learning about the Constitution out there. It's not hard to either look it up or to find yourself reading things um, in interesting ways. There must be dozens and dozens of books on the Constitutional Convention. I'm not going to endorse any one of them. Some of them are deadly boring. <laughs> but there are a few that are engaging and entertaining, and I would commend that you look for those. How's that? All right. And is there, so say you've read it, and now what do these words mean? Um, where, where should people go? Are there textbooks? Is it more than textbooks? How do we really engage and understand? What does it mean to, to protect the First Amendment? What does it read, mean to? Read the seminal Supreme Court cases. And I'm only going to mention a few, all right? Um, but, and I'll mention them in the areas that I think engage most citizens, OK? There's certainly seminal cases in Congress's commerce power and mm. the stuff that doesn't engage people until we rule on something they don't like. And then <laughs> they might come to read those cases. But you just asked about the First Amendment. The seminal case in the First Amendment is the New York Times versus Sullivan. Now, that case arose in the civil rights era where news reporters were reporting on the civil rights movement. And many states were suing news organizations for libel or uh, for libel um, on the theory that they were telling falsehoods about what the states were doing or not doing and how they had acted in the past. And the court there basically said, or said, that before a newspaper or a journalist could be sued for libel or defamation or slander or any of the other forms, there are technical definitions, some are oral and some are written, of what defamation and slander and libel are. Um, you had to prove that the journalists were acting out of actual malice. They were telling falsehoods or falsely disregarding the truth. By elevating the standard of proof, the court intended and has ensured a robust freedom of speech in our country. Because if people who are reporting on critical or speaking about critical events in our country are fearful of being sued, that will stifle their speech. So two things operated there. One, the First Amendment. But second, the courts, in ensuring that the First Amendment was implemented in a way that would protect its core values, expression of thought and speech. So if we can go through, I'm going to list a couple. The Fourth Amendment, 
the right against unreasonable search and seizures. The government has to engage in reasonable search and seizures. But one of the seminal cases in that is Katz versus United States. And that had to do with the police taking an instrument and putting it on the outside of a phone booth. Most of the students here don't even know what a phone That's booth is. Probably, right? yes. You can, you can Google Have that. Have you seen them on the movies, like on <laughs> TV? Just imagine. It was a classed and closed area <laughs> where you could talk, pick up the phone, and put in some coins and call somebody. This is so alien to most of them. Um, at any rate, the government put a listening device on the outside. And so the question was whether that was an unreasonable search and seizure because it was done without a warrant, a court warrant. And the argument, contrary to it being an unreasonable search and seizure, was that up until then, the court had only recognized um, government intrusion into your protected speech. If they went in, they committed basically a trespass. They went into your home or went into your private space and listened to what you were doing. But now we have a listening device, right? And it's not inside the room with you, it's on the outside. And the court created a reasonable of ex expectation of privacy test, which is you being in that phone booth and closing the door alerted the world that you had an expectation that you would not be listened to. That was revolutionary in constitutional history. But the court, again, animating the principles of the Fourth Amendment, said that to protect privacy, we had to ensure that your expectation of it would be respected. So you get Miranda versus Arizona. Everybody in this place has heard about defendants being told their rights before they inculpate themselves. Gideon versus Wainwright, the Sixth Amendment, your right to an attorney if you're being criminally charged. Fundamental shift that only happened in the latter half of the last century. But there the court recognized if your rights under the Constitution were to be protected, especially when your life was not at liberty any longer, that you had to do it with a lawyer. And finally, again, the Eighth Amendment, the right against cruel and unusual punishment, Atkins versus Virginia, Roper versus Simmons, the state can't execute children under the age of 18 or those who are mentally disabled. Those are qu quite core protections in our society. And all of them are part of our constitutional order. And you should read them. First, because they will help engage you in what the court views as the important underpinnings of our constitutional rights. But you should also read the dissents. Not accept them, but at least read them. <laughs> um, and because there, it will give you the counter argument. And if you're in informed citizenship, you should know why some people believe differently. And then ask yourself the question, as I often do when I read many of these older the older cases, which is, what is it that has changed in our society to make the dissent's positions less acceptable today? Mm -hmm. um, and that, too, informs you about how society reacts to the rights that the Constitution protects. There's one last case that I love that Maeve told me as we were sitting behind that some scholars don't think it's a seminal Supreme Court case. Marbury versus Madison. I beg to differ with those who disagree. Um, for one very important reason. It is known, and I understand this was created by, uh, by professors of law, that it's the first case um, recognizing judicial review of congressional and presidential laws. I call it congressional and presidential because remember, 
Congress passes laws, but the president can veto them. And if he does, they don't become law. And if he remains silent, they do pass. But the point is that these laws um, in many nations at that time viewed Congress's passing of a law as the only basis of constitutionality. And their courts could not review those decisions and determine whether they were unconstitutional in any way. Um, and here's Madison looking at the structure of our government and basically deciding that our structure of government by analyzing the Constitution gave a place to each of the three branches of government. And for the few of you here who don't know what they are, <laughs> the executive, the legislative, and the judicial branches, a check and balance on each other. That's why there was a veto of the uh, Congress's power to legislate. And it was the duty of the courts to review legislation to ensure that they complied with the Constitution. That really is the foundation of our modern system of government, that view of the tripart system of government as being created as a check and balance on each other. And so for me, that's a seminal case as well. Oh, and I think such a great example of why, like you said, it's important to go to these cases that have over the years interpreted because nowhere in this document are you going to find the words that say the Supreme Court or the courts have the power to do this. It's certainly implicit, but it's understanding of the structure that leads you to, to understand the document better. Exactly, and right. that's what Madison did. He looked at the structure in government and said, again, like the other courts had done, what animates this structure? What is critical to its very being? And you won't read that in the Constitution, that the courts are the last arbiters of constitutionality, but it's what made sense. Right. Um, and, and just as I know you've been very busy this last few weeks um, because of your books, if, um, for those of you who have not picked them up, I, I highly recommend that you do a very moving picture book about um, the justice's um, life through books and um, sort of an adaptive version of her uh, middle school. And as I was reading those, I got to the point where you talk about learning and understanding and studying the Constitution for the first time. And I was wondering if you could share um, a little bit about that when you learning about what was happening in the South and what judges were doing. Uh, and um, you know, most people don't understand how critical laws are in their lives. Um, I speak, as you were told, to elementary school and middle school and high school students, college and law school students, and a lot of other professional students as well. And I often start with the simplest example of how laws affect people every day of their lives virtually. Go to the corner and stop on red. Why do people do that? Most kids will say, because my parents told me I had to. <laughs> but who told their parents? And who tells us? The laws do. And that law creates a relationship among us. By all of us complying with that law, we agree to help each other reach safe places. Because none of us will defy the law intentionally, we hope or regularly, and put everyone else at risk. We give up that little extra time that some of us might beat everybody else to get where they're going, so the community is safer. That's a law we like, right? It's a law that we accept because we understand what we're giving up, but, and why. But all laws do that. They regulate our interests as a society and a community. And so we have decided that kids are gonna to go to school, right? We now permit parents to homeschool kids, but under certain government regulation. Why? Because as a community, we've decided that an educated population helps us develop better as a community. There are other laws that we're sometimes not sure of, okay? Laws that people don't like or that think that the balance we've reached in the law 
puts too much of an onus on one group rather than another. And those are laws that we're constantly talking about and trying to change and trying to get the balance a little bit better. Well, the Constitution, in its own way, is that big law. It tells the three branches of government their relationship with each other. And then it tells the states and the people in our nation what can be not done by the government and in which area the government has powers and in which area it doesn't. And that relationship is what led me to become a lawyer. It was fundamental to me that I understood that playing a voice for lawyers in helping relationships between, among government entities, with states and people, and between each and among all, that that was such an important job that I wanted to be a voice in it. Right. But I want people to recognize that mine, or even that of lawyers and judges, is not the only voice. We have an obligation to understand that we must be active participants in forming and refining those relationships. Laws are made by men. And I use the gender neutral sense of that word, men and women. And good laws can be supported by them. And laws that people don't think are perfect we're here to create a more perfect union, should be changed. But that doesn't happen without active participation. So for me, the people who live by the code of the law are the heroes I admire. The judges who were there during the, in the South during the civil rights movement. Judges who were born in a segregated society who probably believed, because they had been taught, mm -hmm. that blacks were unequal, who despite their entire cultural orientation, in the name of the rule of law, ordered the integration of institutions that they had grown up in. Mm -hmm. And those men were reviled by the general population many death threats, some had things burnt in front of their homes, their families were threatened, and then, but despite that, they believed in our 13th and 14th Amendments, and they believed in the rule of law and did what it took to ensure that the law was followed. Um, for me, I can't think of any greater heroes, and they're the ones that we should be looking up to, the people who fight and have fought for this Constitution. Right. Um, and I, I imagine by the time that you were learning about these judges in the South, um, you probably had an awareness of some of the provisions, if not had read it cover to cover. And I'm wondering if you can think back with the full benefit of hindsight now um, and this idea of the Constitution sort of regulating relationships and communities and think about how did you as a child growing up in the Bronx, how did the Constitution have a direct impact in your life? Well, it's pretty simple for me to describe that. May 25th, 1954, um, the Supreme Court decided Brown versus Board of Education. I was born exactly a month later, June 25th, 1954. I've just told everybody my age again. <laughs> um, one month later, I went from what was essentially a segregated nation, a little bit less in New York City, but certainly segregated across the nation in so many different ways, to a nation that would slowly but surely, and it's still fighting that civil rights fight, mm -hmm. fight integrate. We are in this room together, men, women, of every ethnic background because of that one case and because of this document. That 
is a fundamental effect on all of our lives, as is some of the other cases I spoke to you about, as is the major Supreme Court decisions that continue to evolve. Every day, laws affect you. Remember the red light every time you stop. <laughs> um, and you know, we started with, with some statistics that uh, Julie sort of set out for us, and um, some of them, you know, a little bit surprising um, and and honestly a little bit scary. And I'm wondering, um, what what is in your opinion at stake if if those numbers don't change? And in particular, wondering if you see a connection um, between this lack, this gap that we have in civic education and our democratic values and the importance of democratic values? It is not my observation. I am um, reporting on the observations of others, especially Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who was one of the first to speak about this. She noted that the lack of uh, civility in our political system started to grow and coincide with the lack of civic education. As the um, resources got switched to teaching items such as STEM, a very important support necessity in education, what began to happen was a cutback on civic, civic education. Today, there's only a handful of states who still require civic education to be taught in their schools. Believe it or not, Florida's taking the lead in this. Um, Arizona, Justice uh, Sandra Day O'Connor's home state, has been and just begun an initiative to try to do it as well. As Washington State has, Massachusetts is looking at initiatives. But the fact that we're fighting for more resources and attention to civic education in our schools shows you that there's a real danger that we will do what Ben Franklin feared. We will lose our Republican form of government. If you don't understand the value of what you have, it's too easy to lose. Um, there's a book out now, and I'm not recommending the book necessarily, but I, I understand its thesis, called The Depth of Democracy. And it goes through what happened in Germany which was a democracy until Hitler took over. And what it shows is that an uninformed citizenry permitted one of the greatest atrocities in human history to occur. How does that happen? It happens when citizens forget the value of what's important in their constitutional order. And so for me, those statistics are not just sobering, they're scary. Yes. They're frightening about what we as a nation will become unless we respect what we were given. That's absolutely right. And um, I know that we have some questions from the audience. Um, and the audience knows I like walking around. I think they're This audience us. should. Just don't get up unexpectedly. Um, because my security people get very nervous. <laughs> um, you know, they're here to protect me from myself. So, Carmen, yes. I'm gonna walk around with the Constitution That's in case one of them yes. asks me something. Okay. And I'm sure we'll, some of these questions I hope will continue on, not ending on that side note, but talking about what, sort of what comes next. Um, now, if you're, if it's your question, raise your hand, and you may have to say yo or something. Um, <laughs> because and I'm going to ask for the lights to be put up a little bit so I can see who I'm talking to. And we have a photographer that will take a picture with you if it's your question. You see? You should have submitted a question. <laughs> Go ahead, Carmen. All right. 
Well, this one doesn't have a name, but sort of in it uh, follows on what we were just talking about. In light of the abysmal statistics regarding constitutional education today, how important do you believe legal education would be in improving the conditions if it's introduced in middle school education? The person who asked the question, hmm. if they could. Back there, what, on what, the right. Oh, who, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing it. George, you see who it is? I came down the wrong side of <laughs> <laughs> All right, can we get them back and, and around to me? I'll be up there. Hello, you guys. How are you? Thank you so much. Look, I know one statistic that to me shows the importance of civic education in middle school. And you know that I'm a great advocate of iCivics.org that creates games for kids to play to, on the computer. Hello, how are you? <laughs> Who, come on. Huh? How are you? Great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what I do know, you are? Mooch. Tell me your name. Mooch. Mooch. Thank you for being here. And thank you for asking the question. It's an on you. <laughs> what we have certificates for at iCivics is that the students who are involved in civic education in middle school do better in high school. And they stay involved in their high school communities and they remain involved as citizens when they go on to college. So is it legal training? I don't think so. I think it's human involvement. It's human engagement in community that we're trying to advocate when we teach civics. And so for me, those statistics support exactly what I'm saying. If you want to create a better world, a better community, you have to teach people that involvement is what's critical. And that's what civic participation is. Involvement in your life. Involvement in the health of your community. And so to me, that is what sold me when I decided to join iCivics. Um, I'm out there to create the better union. And the only way I know how is to encourage others to do what I can't do. I can't get politically involved. And you don't have to be politically involved to be engaged in civics, but I do think it helps to know what you're going to be involved in. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. All right. The next question is from Amanda Brown, and she signs that you're number one fan. Ah. <laughs> Who is that? Is she upstairs? Right. I hope not. Ah, there right. you are. And her question is, what is the one piece of advice you would give to an aspiring lawyer or judge? Oh, one piece of advice. <laughs> Hello, Thank you. How are you? Thank you. Thank you for being here. Come, let's okay. see. Okay. okay. Can you go down a step or you want me to Yeah, step? either way. Okay. Come down a step. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think too many lawyers and actually too many judges forget what our role is. We're here to help people. First and foremost, we're here to help people with their problems. Um, how I came to that simple answer was my niece. She was about six or seven years old, and one day she calls me and she says, Titi. <laughs> Titi is aunt in Spanish. Daddy, who is a, pediatri a pediatric allergist, takes care of wheezers and sneezers. <laughs> <laughs> Mommy, who is a pediatric intensive care nurse, takes care of sick babies. Grandma, my mother, her grandmother, takes care of sick, uh, sick adults. She's a nurse. 
And her stepfather, uh, her step-grandfather, my mother's husband, took care of sick cars. <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> and you know, I just sort of stopped. How do I communicate to a six-year-old what a lawyer does? Um, and I had to think about it and I said, we take care of people who are in trouble with each other. And it's true, that's what lawyers and judges are there to do, to help people with their problems with each other. Now it's too sophisticated to explain that those problems can be between institutions and human beings, <laughs> or among, even among institutions themselves. But what we're doing is helping human relationships. And if we remember that, we end up liking our job more. <laughs> because sometimes you get caught up in the minutia of work and you get caught up in the anger of outcomes and you forget the process. That people are asking for answers under the law that those answers may not always make them happy because you know, when we decide cases, we're deciding who's a winner and who's a loser, right? And the person who lost is never gonna think that they got what they wanted, right? But what we're helping them do is set those boundaries of law. And in that way, sort of start defining their relationships with one another. And so if you wanna be a lawyer or a judge, do it because you want to help people. And if you practice that way and you serve that way as a judge, I think that you will find that you will find a way to do the right thing under the law. So that All right, Justice, I'm going to read two questions now because I think they go so beautifully together. Um, the first one is, with the Constitution turning 231 years today, there are some who say it is out of date. Oh, it's much older than I am, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> um, what would you say to those people about the timelessness of the Constitution? And related to that, um, do you think that our Constitution reflects the technologically advanced society that we are rapidly um, developing? Wow, and, who asked those questions? Right, so the, <laughs> one question was Anna Nelson from Bronx Latin. Yeah. Is that you? And oh, then hi. the related question was um, Zachary Silverman. Ah. Yeah. Both teachers at the same school. Oh, so brought you this as a present too. Feminist with a to-do list. I think I better read this, huh? <laughs> it's, it's stickers. I said I know you're not putting stickers on legal briefs, but <laughs> I saw that and I thought you would love it. Thank you very much. <laughs> would you do me a favor and put your name and address on this, oh, yeah. and then give it to one of these guys with the little things in their ears, because <laughs> they'll hold it for me, okay? Uh, myself and Zachary, actually, these are some of our students, and you visited our school last year. Oh, when I get and to that side, I'll take a picture with them, okay? Um, but I was going to say, I'm teaching AP Gov, and we just study the Constitution, and the kids are like, the Constitution is so old. And so oh, that was... okay. I'm going to answer that question now, okay? You want to? Thank you. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. Now, it is very old. And my colleague, Justice Ginsburg, was asked whether if someone was creating a new government, a new country today, whether they should use our Constitution <laughs> as a model. And she said, maybe not. <laughs> it is old. And because it's old, um, it may be imperfect in some ways. She recommended that people read the South African Constitution, which is a newer constitution, and one that has what's decidedly missing from ours, a statement of human rights. And so it guarantees health, a decent living, protection of, public, of individual privacy, and other things 
that we are, as a society are still struggling with. We haven't really defined those and their place in our government. Now, um, some state constitutions have and some haven't. And whether or not we would, if we had a new constitutional convention today, elect to create something similar, I don't know. I think that given our history, it's not likely. Mm -hmm. Not likely because we've sort of accepted from our own constitution certain parameters of limiting government in certain ways and on certain issues. But it doesn't mean that this wasn't created to endure centuries. Virtually all of the rights and responsibilities laid out in this constitution are done in very general terms. There's very few specific requirements of our Constitution that are clear. Well, I'll give you an example. Even when they appear clear, um, those issues may someday have to go to the court anyway. So you can't quarter troops in, um, in someone's home during war. But what do you call quartering troops? Do they have to sleep there overnight? If you yet let them use your property for a couple of hours a day to go through, to march to a point that needs to be gone through, is that quartering? Well, someone would say, really not, because you're not sleeping there. But um, how about if you're letting them rest there? with their provisions and minions, and, and uh, with their provisions. Most of the words of the Constitution, however, are not what words. You're protected against unreasonable search and seizures. You're protected against uh, cruel and unusual punishment. Now, at the time that the Constitution was founded, one of my originalist um, colleagues, who was probably the father of originalism, thought that we would not burn someone at the stake today. And at the time of the founding, that was okay. Now, later in life, he changed his mind and said, no, I'm going to be a true originalist. I'm going to say that burning someone at the stake is okay. I don't think so. <laughs> I really would hope that we have become who we've become as a nation because our leaders would never consider that acceptable behavior. And if they were, that we would have a court that would understand that the Constitution required something greater of us and of our leaders. But my point is that it is written in general words to accept the proposition that technology would change our viewpoint. That's what happened with the listening device on the telephone, outside the telephone. That in some ways is what happened when the court considered GPS tracking. And you know, it's one thing to say, as we did in one of our cases, that putting a tracking device under someone's car that's a trespass against that car. But today, you don't even need to do that. You can put a light on someone's car, and that light will follow that car everywhere it goes. And so you have a different view of what the Constitution requires in that case. Are we adequately equipped to deal with technology? You know. Um, I'm not sure we are legally, but I'm not sure we are in any way. You know, what the police tell us is as fast as they work in figuring out to get ahead of criminals in technological advancements, the criminals do better than they faster. And so technology is challenging the entire society not just the courts, to be engaged in discussing issues 
like privacy? Are we going to come to the answers that everyone will uniformly like and accept? I'm not sure. But I don't think you have to rely on the courts for that. That's why we have Congress to debate these things and to try to create and pass laws that will find some consensus within our community. That's the start of many laws. The Supreme Court at first, before Katz, had said that eavesdropping was OK on telephone lines. It was Congress who undid the courts and came with the Eavesdropping Protection Act. And today, we have certain assumptions working within the court about privacy based on what Congress did. So it's not just the courts. It's our entire system of government that makes the Constitution live and live in the way that even an ancient document, 231 years old, <laughs> can still have vibrancy today. So thank you for being teachers. And thank you. Oops, sorry. Michael, 1964. Oh my gosh, not far away from me at all. I'm going to go talk there not too far in the future. All right, Justice, the next question is, as part of um, an outreach program, what would you say is your favorite thing about law in our Constitution, and what motivates you to keep pursuing law? Tell me the first part of that question again, Carmen. I didn't hear the very beginning. Um, as part of legal out of outreach, outreach okay. to students, to our citizenry, what would you say is your favorite thing about the law and the Constitution, and what motivates you to keep pursuing the law? Hmm. That, I'm trying to figure out how I answer that a slight differently than I have already. And it's hard to do, but let me, whose question was that? I, I think we have a young lady walking over your way. Hi, how are you? I, I'm... How many of you watch TV shows involving lawyers? <laughs> you know, I got involved in law because of a TV actor, Perry Mason. <laughs> and how many of you watch lawyers on TV, judges on TV? Virtually every hand here. Movies about lawyers and TV. Movies about our government. It engages you, right? Do you understand why? And that's because lawyers and judges, hello, how are you? That is the lovely handshake. Thank you. Thank you. Come on down. That's a Price of curly hair, we bump into each other. Thank you. Um, why are people so fascinated about it? It's because law is about every human activity. When you're a lawyer, people are coming to you with their problems, right? We just spoke about that earlier. Mm -hmm. What are their problems about? It's about everything that happens in life. So it has to do with parents not staying together. How do they deal with their kids? Very important question, right? Mm -hmm. Law and lawyers get involved with that. We talk about big things like patents and copyrights. What are we going to protect and who? What industry? Are we going to protect the trademark Walt Disney and for how long? How long will Mickey Mouse belong to the Disney company? <laughs> um, I was on a trial for weeks learning about Skin So Soft and Off, a Johnson & Johnson product. <laughs> and whether Skin So Soft really repelled mosquitoes. Now I have to tell you, I don't think that was critical in my life. <laughs> but it was certainly critical in those two companies' life, 
Avon and Johnson and Johnson. And it, I learned more than I ever needed to know about mosquito <laughs> repellent. But that's what people ask law and lawyers and judges to do. Get involved in everything, in every activity that every person and institution does. They ask us to become experts and help them solve their problems. That's the best thing about legal education and about that sense of involvement in community because law is involved in it, in everything. And so for me, that's the exciting part of a legal education is thinking about those relationships. Doesn't mean you can't do it without being a lawyer or studying the law, but I think being knowledgeable about what law does and how it does it and how they're made and how they're changed and all of the things that civic education teaches you helps you in life, enjoy life better. So for me, that's what's the most important. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello. I can't do that. There's too many people here. Though. Hello. Thank you. So, Justice, I've just been giving the official two last questions uh, warning, and as I say that, I see some anxious faces on this side of the room. I'm going um, on that side. <laughs> All right. How do I get behind there? I got to go outside? <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. We'll wait for you. Hold on. <laughs> Gosh, you students are carrying heavy bags. <laughs> All right, I'm going to have to ask you to get up. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, Carmen. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right, Carmen. Oops, sorry. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hello, you guys. I, don't let me. S All right. I'm so glad to know you how to take your shoes off. Thanks. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello, you guys up here. Hi. How are you? Thank you for being here. Can I have a hug? All right. Okay. Where's that lovely photographer? He didn't keep up. No. He did. Wait. 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 All right, Justice, the next question is, how has your life changed since you joined the Supreme Court? Oh. That's the question comes from, from Kay. You know, I, I, it's so hard to describe. Um, one of the reasons I wrote my memoir, My Beloved World, was, hi, when I got nominated to the Supreme Court, I was catapulted. I don't use the word rocket ship because that's almost not fast enough. It seemed like a catapult. Being yanked from my life in New York City, which I love, and from a local sort of existence and stage to a world stage. Now the world looks at everything I do. And people are interested in reading about the darnest things about me. <laughs> I often tell the story. Um, there was an internet posting about my returning home one summer and being on a street fighting with a friend over how to cook chicken. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> my friend didn't. We weren't fighting, but that's not the point. The point was that an internet something or other decided that that was interesting to people. I got very afraid I would lose Sonia in that talk and in that part of my life because we are cast Supreme Court justices as are most politicians in high uh, government positions. We become sort of representatives of things people like or don't like. <laughs> and we stop being human to people. Um, for those who like us, I sometimes worry that that idealization makes you forget that we're human. 
that we will have faults like everyone else. And for the people who dislike us, we become demons. And we get attacked as just being bad people somehow. And my book was an effort to remind myself <laughs> of the fact that I am human and that I wanted to hold on to who Sonia is. And to do that, I wrote my book to remind me of the people who helped me and of the ideals that I had and the principles that I hold. And despite all of that, thank you, I'm still on that world stage. And that's a fundamental change in my life. Um, I am glad that I get to talk to you and to interact with people of all ages and backgrounds and to share my talks and have you ask questions that helps me understand your questions and your thoughts. And those are positive things. And just, yeah, the, the oh. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, tell me your name. I'm Caitlin. Hello, Caitlin. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm fine. <laughs> Thank you for He's being so here. Nice You've made your friends jealous, right? They didn't ask questions. Um, <laughs> where are you? Wait around, I'll come afterwards. <laughs> I'll come up afterwards, just don't leave, okay? I'll get there. But it has been a whirlwind for me, it still continues. Um, it's something I like, my loss of privacy I don't. And my sense sometimes of being able to walk around anonymously has disappeared. I tell students all the time, imagine losing the ability to sit in the back of the classroom and just to listen to people talk. All right. We've got to put some Puerto Rican pride over here. <laughs> I'm now in the front of the classroom all the time, and people are listening to me talk. I liked it the other way a lot. <laughs> All right, Dustin, then the last question is um, from Lily Sabella. <laughs> ah. Ah. I'm am... coming up there, Lily, so I'll get you. Okay. <laughs> All right, one of my guys has to go out and figure out how I'm getting up there. All right. <laughs> Really loving all the questions from the students. Um, and it's, it's a simple question, I think one that um, will reveal a lot about who you are personally, and it's, uh, who is your hero? I'm sorry. Who is your hero? Oh, my mom. And where's my students from the school? All right, I'm gonna come. Where, where do you start? Where does the class start? We're right here? Move down. Come on, move. you gotta move down once. I'll explain that in a moment. All right, let's sit, move over, look. Okay, all right. All right, and now we're all gonna sit in this aisle and they're all gonna stand behind us, okay? All right, pero esto me lo tienen que mover. All right, gracias. Thank you. Hello. All right. Yes. All right, guys. Thank you. If you can bend down just a little bit. Thank you, Slo. Anyway, oh, going thank back, you so much. thank you. Um, I think if most kids stop and think, they would probably answer the same way I do. Most of our parents give their lives for us, don't they? They sacrifice everything. Um, they try the hardest they can. They make mistakes. 
I explain at length in my book the many I thought my mother had made. Um, but I also understood the many things she had done right. Hi. They came from up there? I was going up there. It would be easier. Yeah? Okay. All right. Come on down, guys. Anyway, um, it was clear what my mother had sacrificed for me. And in fact, when I was being considered for the Supreme Court, I called my mom one day and said, I'm thinking about whether if I were asked, should I do this or not? And she, uh, you know, you're getting older, you need me more. If I take a job like this, um, I won't have as much time for you. And I worry about that. And she said, Sonia, your brother will make time if need be. <laughs> and by the way, and by the way, he has. So I have a lot to be indebted to him for. But then she said, I spent my whole life sacrificing for you. Don't take this moment of joy from me. Aww. Having your children do what they can in the world is what every mother prays for. And so I realized that she was my hero for a reason, because she's like every other mother in this room who spends this, their time working really hard to give you a better life. That's the greatest gift any mom can give. They are our heroes. And so, yeah. So, uh, Come on, guys. <laughs> you all have to wait a few minutes, sorry. Hi. But you have to move in, sweetie. Thank you. You have pictures hanging up in my elementary school. Oh, thank you. Come because you got to let your friends in. All right. Yeah. Come on, guys. Come, come. Come. Yes. Perfect. All right. And then the rest of you move a little bit. We're going to sit. You're going to sit in these chairs. All right. I'm going to sit with you. And then some of you up here. Perfect. This is wonderful. Okay. I asked the question. Yeah, but you, but you got a picture. Let her sit down. <laughs> All right. Oh, All right. So, thank you, you guys. It's nice. What high school are you from? All my high school. Uh, oh. Private legal outreach. I love it. Thank you. She's your number one fan, but I'm your number two. Aww. <laughs> no, 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 I'm Thank your number you. one. <laughs> <laughs> so nice to meet you. Thank you, you guys. Well, I hope I've inspired everybody to go out and read the Constitution. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Woo. Thank you. I know we had more questions and unfortunately we're, we're at the end of our time but thank you justice so much for for sharing this evening with us for celebrating constitution day and really inspiring hopefully a whole group of people to go out there and become like you said citizen lawyers and and learn what it is in that precious document that uh, protects our relationships in our communities um, and and thank you to everyone for being here and taking the time yeah. bye bye, -bye guys. We do ask everyone. Uh,